Okay, so good evening again, everyone. Um, tonight we pick up with the last part of Matthew 27 and the related verses. So let me scroll down here and get to the beginning of that. Last time we left off with the death of Jesus, and it was mostly John's account that we're following. This was the final acts uh, or events, if you will, took place as he was being crucified prior to his death and um, as he died on the cross and um, the scriptures that were fulfilled there. So we're looking at Wednesday afternoon, Abib 14th. This is the day portion of the 14th of the first month. We're looking at roughly mid-afternoon, three o'clock-ish sort of. So even though he died around three o'clock in the afternoon, it still would have taken several hours for, as we'll see here in a moment, uh, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus um, to take the body down, to wrap it to the point that they did. The uh, Jews had a, a process. This is what the women would go through later in preparing a body for permanent burial, but in order to get him in the grave before the holy day, they simply quickly washed the body and wrapped it in linen and then placed it in the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea had. But upon his death, and there were several miracles that happened, and this is where we pick everything up. So Matthew 27, verse 51, it says, Behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from the top to the bottom. So this right here was a miracle. It was a heavy cloth that separated the, the holy... Uh, holy part of the temple, excuse me, from the holy of holies. So the holy part that the the part the priests could go into regularly had the showbread, had the altar of incense, um, but the holy of holies they could only go into on atonement. And so the the veil that separated those two areas was a really thick, heavy curtain. And so we see here that that was torn, not for the bottom to the top. So you could make a cut and two really strong men could begin to tear it from the bottom to the top. But this is on a rod covering this area. And so it splits from the top to the bottom. Now, symbolically, that has great meaning because what we find is that the Holy of Holies was not accessible except, as I said, on atonement. The priest had to make atonement for himself, his family, before he could go in and make atonement for the nation. So the access, if you will, to God's throne was limited. But now that there is the perfect sacrifice, paying for our sins, that we can be cleansed daily as God required, that provides now the opportunity, if you will, that we can go before God daily, multiple times a day, whenever we desire need to. So that access is no longer restricted. Uh, Christ is now our perfect high priest, as a uh, I think it is Hebrews where Paul talks about, you know, he doesn't have to offer for himself. And as our perfect high priest, he can make intercession for us regularly. Um, and so then he can also live in us with God's spirit. So the veil's torn. And then the next thing is that earthquake. There was a major earthquake. It says strong enough to split rocks. Um, Mark 15, Luke 23 simply mentioned the veil being torn, although Luke indicates or reaffirms that it was still dark out. If you remember in the previous study, that whole afternoon period was unusually dark, not just like heavy cloud cover. It was almost like um, twilight. So the veil's torn, a major earthquake, and because of that, verse 52 of Matthew 27, the tombs were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised, that is, back to physical life. Now, some will want to point to this and highlight this as sort of a resurrection to spirit, but that's not mentioned here. Um, it simply is that they're given life, physical life, once again. Um, and so then... Verse 53, we're given a timing that was coming out of their tombs after the resurrection. So this is three days of the inset thought here. And people knew this was the case because the end of verse 53, it says, they entered into the holy city, that is Jerusalem, and appeared to many. And how would you not know? Let's just say a dozen 
tombs were open, the news that that would make in the city, or even just one, as it did with Lazarus. Verse 54, then, of Matthew 27. Now the centurion and those who were with him watching Jesus, when they saw the earthquake and the things that were done, feared exceeding, exceedingly, saying, truly, this was a man of God. That is, normally, they're just criminals, right? Um, they didn't have any feeling one way or the other. In fact, many times they made sport of it, as we noted in some of the previous studies. And yet here, because he sees these events and the other things that were happening, he, he had a change of heart. He, he had heard the accusations from the Jews. Christ claimed to be the Son of God. This news was throughout Jerusalem. The Roman soldiers would have heard it as well. And so he sees and he says, this was the Son of God. Um, Mark's account says the same thing. Luke is slightly different, saying certainly this was a righteous man. So again, sometimes critics will point to these differing reports, but they don't have to be exclusive. Neither one of them, John or, I'm sorry, Matthew or Luke, neither one of them say this is the only thing he said. Matthew could have heard one part of it. Luke could have heard the other, which is common even in this day. That as you have a conversation, you can have one person say, well, I heard him say this. Another person say, well, I heard him say that. And they, they're not that they're both right or wrong. It's just they, they, we hear things differently as our brain tunes into it. So then verse 55, going back to Matthew 27, it says, Many women were there watching from afar who had followed Jesus from Galilee, serving him. Among them were Mary Magdalene, mother of, the Mar mother of James and Joseph. Um, this is not Mar the, the mother of Z the sons of Zebedee. This is a different Mary. And the mother of the sons of Z uh, Zebedee. It, so that one is, but James and Joseph were different. So anyway, this is just highlighting a few of the women that followed him. And it seems that there was a regular group, if you will, that not only followed and listened to him like the other disciples did, but they also helped provide means. You know, for instance, when they were at Lazarus's house, um, Martha and Mary would serve. Others did this at different times. Um, Mark's account mentions the same, um, but also then adds, so Mark 15, verse 41, speaking of the women who, when he was in Galilee, followed him, served him, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So they were just as impacted in a positive way by Christ's message. They wanted to hear it as much as they could. And so they followed him as well. Um, to Luke's account, Luke 23, verse 48 says, All the multitudes that came together to see this, when they saw the things that were done, returned home beating their breasts. So originally, this is the crowd that was crying out to Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. And now they see these things happen, the veil torn, the earthquake and as a centurion, they have a change of heart here, returned home, beating their breasts. They were very disappointed in themselves. So to finish with the count, all the witnesses, the only one from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. So the only one that we know was up close of his disciples was... So... All his acquaintances could have included many of the other disciples, the apostles, as they came to be called. But there's also the 70 that he sent out. So there were a number of disciples and acquaintances, and they were there to witness these events as well. So then next up, we have Christ's body taken down and placed in the tomb. And so again, this would have taken at least an hour, if not longer. Um, and so I'll pick up with Mark's account, Mark 15. So again, this is Wednesday afternoon, getting late in the day, daylight portion. It says, when evening had now come, because it was the preparation day. So evening, not dark. Evening meaning well past noon, moving towards dark. So the preparation day is any day before a Sabbath on a weekly basis, that's Friday, and this is where many get confused in the Christian world because they think Friday is the only preparation day for the Jews. And so this is why they say, well, this was Friday. 
and then the account we may probably the insurrection um, happens and the women go to the tomb and Peter and Jane or uh, yeah Peter and John um race to the tomb that's that's all happening on Sunday so that's why they say Friday to Sunday so but Mark clarifies the prepar day, preparation day was the day before a high Sabbath um that is what we would call a holy day so this is Wednesday this is the only day that fits, or excuse me, the only year that fits a Saturday, late Saturday resurrection with the events on Sunday, and then backing up, excuse me, that you get the three days and three nights takes you to late Wednesday. And so this is why we teach, historically have taught, it's 31 AD. It's the only year that fits around that time period. Um, there is one other year, if you don't include postponements required in the calendar, some will teach that, but as an aside, we know there are postponements because of the previous year. Um, that's a whole calendar discussion I'm not going to get into, but there, there's good reason why we uh, teach that it's 31. So anyway, so then um, to continue in Mark 15, verse 43, then we read that Joseph of Arimathea, Matthew just says a rich man, so we know Joseph was rich, but Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member who also himself was looking for God, God's kingdom came. Now, there's also some indication here that Joseph of Arimathea was also a family friend. Um, and there is some tradition that say that he actually sort of watched over Jesus after the death of his stepfather, Joseph. Now, there's not much to corroborate that, but as I mentioned last time, Joseph of Arimathea was a, a tin merchant, which was a critical element needed for bronze, and and so that would have made him very wealthy. So um, the council mentioned here, a prominent council member was the Sanhedrin. So he was very well connected. Um, John's account, John 19, verse 38, shows us that Joseph was a disciple of Christ. And this wasn't just somebody looking from a distance that had seen Christ, you know, not a disciple, but had heard of him, saw him when he came before the Sanhedrin or around the city previously and was sort of taken by him. This was a man who had committed himself to what Christ came and taught because as Mark's account says, was looking for God's kingdom. So this is an interesting thing to consider here because at, even as a Jew, the Romans wouldn't have cared at this point. Christ is dead. They've accomplished the crucifixion. Pilate's you know, out of the picture because this is now done. But, but this would have raised the irritation of the rest of the Sanhedrin because the night previous when they did their kangaroo court Christ was brought before the Sanhedrin, and they changed the charges, and they ended up sentencing him as a capital crime, knowing the Romans would kill him. Not all the council was there. And yet, they're going to be irritated at somebody like Joseph of Arimathea, because he's honoring this man's death. The rest of the Jews would have just left him there for the Romans to take care of. And so he's sort of putting a mark on himself. Um, to go to Luke 23 and verse 50, it says, not only was he a member of the council, but a good and a righteous man, notice verse 51, he had not consented to their council indeed. So even if he had been there the San, with the Sanhedrin, the rest of the group, the previous evening when they sentenced Christ, he did not agree to it. So Arimathea is a city that is almost due west of Jerusalem, about 20 some miles, I think, if I remember properly. Um, north or west and a little north. So um, verse 52 of Luke 23 then tells us that he is the one that went to Pilate and asked for Jesus's body. Mark records the same thing, so does Matthew. And so does John. So they they all in agreement of this. It needed to be taken down before the holy day. Now, the other thing to bear in mind here is this would have made Joseph unclean to participate in the holy day. So if you go back to Numbers 
and other places uh, in the uh, Torah, God told Israel that if a person touched a dead body, they had to be outside the camp. In most cases, it was outside the camp until sundown. Um, in some cases, depending, it would have been longer, but the general would have been clean. So this would have made him unclean for a time. And we'll see that he didn't, he didn't care at this point. There was something more important here. So to continue in Mark 15, verse 44, it says, Pilate marveled if he were already dead. That is, he marveled that Christ had already died. Um, this normally, this crucifixion process uh, could take a whole day, if not longer, depending on the punishment they wanted to give to the person. The Romans were masters, if you will, at this. They had, they had over centuries perfected this process in a gruesome way, and they could extend the life as long as they wanted to almost torture somebody until the body just finally gave up. And so Pilate's pretty stunned here that Christ had died already because from the time he left Christ, the time Christ left the audience with Pilate until his death was only about six hours, not a long time for what the Romans would typically do. And so Pilate summons the centurion and asks him whether he had been dead for very long. And when he found from, out from the centurion that he, he had died, um, he granted the body to Joseph. So he was simply confirming that he could make that decision and not get himself in trouble with his own Roman authorities that he had interrupted the process. So Matthew's account says Pilate commanded the body, which he would have been able to do as the governor. John's account, John 19, the end of verse 38, says there, Pilate gave him permission, meaning Joseph of Arimathea, permission. So he came, therefore, and took away his body, meaning Joseph took away Christ's body. So to continue in John's account, then, we're told about Nicodemus here. Um, the others don't mention Nicodemus, but John's account does. So in John 19 and verse 39, he says, Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes and about a hundred Roman pounds, of about a ro hundred Roman pounds. So a hundred Roman pounds is roughly 75 imperial pounds, which is what we use. So 34 kilograms, roughly. Um, that's no small amount and by its own measure would have been worth some money. And again, Nicodemus would have made himself unclean. Um, also would have painted a mark much like Joseph of Arimathea. Nicodemus was part of the council as well. And the reason he first came to Jesus by night was he didn't want <laughs> yet it to be known that he counseled, if you will, questioned Jesus, not in a wrong way, not as the Jews did to condemn him. He was curious and he wanted to understand what he was teaching because he saw value in, in what he said. So even Nicodemus, in his own way, is honoring Christ here in his death. So to continue in John's account, John 19, verse 40, says, So they, Nicodemus, Joseph, and probably a few others to help, even the women probably, they took Jesus' body and bound it in linen cloths with the spices as the custom of the Jews is to bury. Now, this was the short version. The women wanted to do the long version later. And we'll see as we progress here. The next day is the holy day. Obviously, there's no work done. It's a Sabbath day. Friday, then, would have been the preparation for the Sabbath, and they would have been able to buy the spices and so forth and prepare, but they wouldn't have had time to go to the tomb and do what they wanted to do in terms of the, the completion of the, of the full process. And so then they had to wait for the weekly Sabbath, and then Sunday, late Saturday or uh, towards the morning or Sunday morning, they were wanting to go to the tomb to finish all of that. So it, this is the short version here of what they did. So verse 40, they took Jesus's body, bound in the linen and cloth with spices, as we said there. All the other counts say roughly the same thing. They took him down, they wrapped him in linen, um, and, and prepared his body in that fashion. So then verse 41 of John 19, now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, 
and the garden was a new tomb which no man had ever yet been laid. So the, the indication here is that it was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. He was wealthy enough to have done this because this is a tomb that's going to be in very close proximity to Jerusalem. And there's been uh, no end of speculation over the centuries as to where it was that Christ was crucified. It says Golgotha, but that's not generally agreed to as to where it is, just that it was close to Jerusalem. So it could have been near Gethsemane. Most now today place it just north of the, the, the proper area, the wall around Jerusalem. Um, but the point is, it was in a tomb no other body had been used. Um, Luke's account says that as well. Mark's account simply says cut out of rock, but he adds the detail that a stone was rolled or, or was there to roll in front of the tomb to close it, um, as does Matthew. Matthew says that they laid, out, laid it out in his own new tomb, which is why we we see that it was Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And he rolled a great stone against the tomb of the door and departed. Now, it's it's important there, he says, rolled a great tomb. And so um, if you can picture a doorway, and again, Jews of this day would not be as tall as Americans or many Western Europeans. Um, think more of uh, five foot, probably if they were five and a half feet, they were tall. Most people were around that size or, or shorter. So not as tall a door as we would have. Most of our doors are like six foot eight as a standard here in the U.S. Um, but the tomb door would have been excess stone, if you will, to make sure it was all covered. And then also picture in front of this a trough cut into the stone that would have been in a decline so that when the stone was rolled, it had the proclivity to stay shut. So if the trough went the other direction, the stone potentially could roll or could it more easily roll away from the door. They wanted it to stay in front of the door. Um, so nonetheless, six foot piece of stone, even if it was only about four or five inches thick, would weigh hundreds and hundreds of pounds. Um, and so these are all just interesting details to consider here. Going back to John 19, verse 42, it says, Then because of the Jews' preparation day, for the tomb was near at hand. So we know it was close to Jerusalem. They laid Jesus there. To go to uh, Luke's account, Luke 23, verse 54, we're again told that it was the preparation day as the Sabbath was drawing near. Verse 55, the women who had come out with him out of Galilee followed after, saw the tomb and how his body was laid. So they were witnesses as to where he was put, which is why they knew where to go early Sunday morning when they went to go do the longer process of, of uh, permanent burial. Um, Mark's account again mentions Mary Magdalene and the mother of Joseph seeing where um, Christ was uh, laid, as does Mark's account, or excuse me, Matthew's account. Um, so then we come to the, the holy day. So only Matthew reports this portion now. So this is Thursday, sometime on Thursday. This would have been the 15th of Abib. It says the next day, Matthew 27, verse 62, the next day, which was the day after the preparation day, which makes it the holy day now, the chief priests and the Pharisees were gathered together to Pilate. So they go back to Pilate, which is very interesting because they themselves would have then if you wanted to make the case that they had made themselves unclean, <laughs> you could have done so. But it's also interesting that they could justify this as business that could be done on the holy day. So they go to Pilate and they say to him, Sir, we remember that the deceiver, it's interesting, they still have great hatred for Christ here. That the deceiver said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise again. So if you remember the the time he was asked to basically prove, give a sign of his messiahship. And he said, the only sign I will give you is the sign of Jonah, that I will be in the belly of the grave three days and three nights. He didn't say three days where we could parse portions of days. He makes it very clear, three days and three nights. 
This is why we reject, among other things, the teaching of a Friday afternoon death and a Sunday morning resurrection. You, you're lucky to get 48 hours out of that, let alone 72. But they remember this. They remember what Christ said. Look, he said three days he's going to rise again. So they say to Pilate, verse 64, Command, therefore, that the tomb be made secure until the third day, lest perhaps his disciples come at night and steal him away and tell the people he's risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. They said, we can just see this happening. If there's nobody there, they're going to roll the stone away. They're going to take his body, and they're going to say, look, 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 he was resurrected. This is the, this is the argument they're making. And they said, if that's accomplished, then everything else that will come to that will be even worse than what he taught. So Pilate says to them, I mean, I can just imagine Pilate's impatient with him, impatience with them at this point. And he simply says, go, make it as secure as you can. Just go, go ahead and do it. You know, Pilate didn't believe any of this anyway. So he said, you can have a guard, make it secure. So they went with the guard and made the tomb secure, sealing the stone. Now, the pictures I've seen would have been like, I mean, the stone itself is fairly secure. You're going to need a couple of men to move this thing out of the way. But probably what they did was took a long, excuse me, a long piece of cloth, long enough to cover the stone, and they would have affixed a wax seal on both sides. And so that if then you wanted to roll the stone out of the way, you had to pull that cloth off. Would have, you know that's the whole purpose of a seal. You can see that it's been removed. So this is what they went and did. So then we come to Friday. The rest of the holy day comes and goes. Then on Friday, the women go about to prepare the spices. And it's only Mark and Luke that records this. Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, this is the holy day Sabbath, not the weekly Sabbath. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Siloam, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, Luke says that they returned, and on the Sabbath day, they rested. So we know that this was Friday. It does not fit a Friday death Sunday resurrection because they wouldn't have had time to buy these on Friday and rested on the Sabbath. Between the point of his death and the uh, Jewish authorities going to Pilate, requesting the tomb be sealed, all these sort of things. So there's just two more verses that show there were two Sabbaths during that week, a holy day and a weekly Sabbath. So now we come to the very last part of this all. We move to Matthew 21, excuse me, 28 verse 1 and Mark 16 verse 1. It says, when the Sabbath, after the Sabbath, Mark says, when the Sabbath was passed, as it began to dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. Mark's account says they, bought, after they had bought spices. We know that was on Friday. So after the Sabbath, they came to anoint him. So they're coming sometime very early Sunday morning. They would not have come out Saturday night. It would have progressively gotten darker and darker. And this is not something they were going to do in the dark in sort of a secretive manner. They needed light and they needed somebody to remove the stone. And even with the guards, they probably wouldn't have left it yet. And so they're going to go out and undo what Joseph and Nicodemus had done in haste. They were going to undo that, probably wash the body again, anoint it with all of these spices that they had prepared, rewrap the body for permanent burial. So as they do that then, they're coming, as it says, before dawn, Matthew, Matthew 28, verse 1. Now, that first part of Matthew 28, 1 is very interesting because the word Sabbath there is plural not singular. So it says, now after the Sabbaths, as it began to dawn on the first of the week, the word day there is not in the Greek manuscripts. The first of the week is also not accurate because in the Greek, the word weeks is the same word for Sabbath and it's plural again. So we could read it after the Sabbaths, as it began to dawn on the first of the Sabbaths, so this verse makes a connection again to the holy days that Christendom has rejected. But why is this important? Because it also lays out the wave sheaf offering that many have lost 
um, understanding of to this day. What we find here is that Christ is also, he's not done in what he's going to fulfill. And one of the major things he's going to fulfill here is the wave sheaf offering. And the whole point of the wave sheaf offering was for Israel to wait for the spring harvest. And then they would gather the green ears of usually barley was the crop in the spring. They would beat out the offering that Christ or God said to bring to him. The priest would offer it. Once that was offered, then they could do the first fruit harvest. And that's represented in culmination during the, the, the Feast of Pentecost. So it's the initial harvest, which is much smaller than the fall harvest. But the parallels there are just really interesting. You know, we call ourselves from Scripture first fruits. Those who God is calling now is much smaller compared to the harvest he's going to do with the rest of mankind that are fulfilled in the millennium and the last great day. And so just all of these things that come together here. Mark's account says very early on the first of the weeks they came when the sun had risen. So we they they came after sunrise. Um, Luke's account, Luke 24, verse 1, says that others came as well, bringing the spices. And John, along with Matthew, highlights that Mary Magdalene was there while it was still dark. So it's that timing between what we would call twilight in the morning. You can see the sun, but coming up, the sky is brightening, but you don't see the sun yet. And then the timing of when the sun comes, as Mark says, the sun had risen. So in Mark's account, Mark 16, verse 3, the, the women say to themselves, who will roll away the stone door for us? It, again, it's very heavy, and it's on an upward to roll it would mean essentially rolling it uphill. Now, even if it's an incline of, you know, a quarter of an inch every foot, that makes a difference, especially women typically not having the strength of men. Um, and so going back to Mar uh, Matthew's account, in Matthew 28, verse 2, it says there was a great earthquake. So this was the second earthquake in three days. There was the one at the culmination of Christ's death, Wednesday afternoon. So here, Sunday morning, there's another earthquake. It says, for an angel of the Lord descended from the sky and came and rolled away the stone from the door and sat on it, which <laughs> must have been a very curious sight. You know, <laughs> He rolls it away, and then instead of just standing there, it's like he climbs up on the stone and just kind of sits there and waits for them to sort of ask whatever questions they're going to ask. Verse 3 of Matthew 28 says, His appearance was like lightning, and his clothing white as snow. This just unreal brightness of appearance. Verse 4, For fear of him, the guards shook and became like dead men. They fainted, so we know the guards are still here. You know, would they have had to have argued with the Roman soldiers? You know, it's been more than three days. Let us prepare his body. We don't know. Going back to Luke's, uh, sorry, Mark's account, then we pick up more. Verse 4 of Mark 16, it says, For it was very big, this stone that they need to move. Looking up, they saw the stone was rolled back. Entering into the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe. So, very similar in appearance, so it seems that there were two angels that were there, one on the outside, one on the inside. Luke's account, Luke 24, verse 3, says that when they entered, they didn't see Christ's body. The tomb's now empty. Continuing in Luke's account, verse 4, it says, While they were greatly perplexed by this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling clothing. So these two angels... And they were terrified, the women that were there. They bowed their faces down to the earth and said to, and said to them, I'm sorry, this is the angel speaking. Why do you seek the living amongst the dead? He isn't here, but is risen. Remember what he told you when he was still in Galilee. So whether this was information passed on to them or whether these angels were even there, which they could have been, but they're reminding the women what Christ said. He said that this was what would happen. Mark's account is very similar. Mark 15, verse 6. Don't be amazed, these men say, these angels. You seek Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. 
He is risen. He's not here. Behold the place where they laid him. I'm picturing them gesturing out. And they continue, go and tell the disciples and Peter, he goes before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. He said he would show them again. He told them to wait for him in Galilee. So Matthew's account is very similar. Um, so uh, to continue, um, well, let's just go through Ma Matthew's account. So Matthew 28, verse 7, go quickly. He has risen from the dead. Behold, he goes before you to Galilee. There you will see him. So verse 8, they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. This mixture of emotions. I mean, they don't understand these men were probably just overwhelming in appearance. They, they seem kind. They're speaking soothing words to them. But I mean, how many times do you see an angel? And so that part's very unsettling. But to hear the news that he is risen, that he's going to show himself to them in Galilee, that's exciting. I mean, they heard all these things, but the reality of seeing him crucified was just crushing, probably. And then to hear these words, so this mixture of emotions with fear and great joy, they ring, ran to bring his disciples his word, the word. And so they're still figuring this out, but their initial um, foyer, if you will, into the tomb was not what they thought it was going to be. So then we come to the next section, which is. Um, the women come to the tomb. This is um, more complete in, in that um, we, we see them leave and then we see them come back. So now then the disciples are going to come. Initially, Peter and uh, John, they're going to see the tomb empty as well. Then Christ is going to show himself to others and the story unfolds from there. So while tonight was short, I didn't want to get into the next section because there's more that I want to cover there. For the sake of time, we'll do that next time. So there's a lot that ha has happened in this, what we've covered this evening. So we went from Wednesday evening, uh, late afternoon, Christ dying, taken off the cross, his body hurriedly prepared, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus preparing the body in haste, placing it in the tomb. The holy day comes. The Jewish authorities go to Pilate, request the tomb sealed so that it doesn't seem that he's going to be able to be taken, his body. The women come Friday to buy spices and prepare those things. The weekly Sabbath comes. They rest again. Sunday early, early morning they go and they find him now risen. So um, from here, there's not much left, um, probably one more or two more studies, and then we'll be able to conclude this coverage of the harmonies. And so that's where we'll end it for this evening.